Flashback to 2013. A younger me with my Asus laptop. It was around my birthday, and after browsing through Steam for hours on end, and having a lot of talks with friends from the time, I decided to get my mum to buy me two games. Portal 1 and Portal 2. Little did I know how influential these games would be on my life. As even after coming out as transgender, and moving houses, losing friends, and all the troubles I've been through, they've stuck with me. It makes me somewhat emotional talking about it. But these games honestly mean a lot to me. Portal is an all-time classic. The writings, the characters, the gameplay, and the environment are all nailed and will ever hold a special place in many people's hearts, as proven by the amount of content still being produced by the fandom. The story of the game is well documented, all logged throughout the fan-made wiki and developer interviews, but there's always been one thing that I've noticed while looking at these. All the fan games are left out. This is for an obvious reason. They aren't official, they're not canon, they don't have a place in the universe because they're not written by the developers. Well, I don't care. Simple as that. So I set myself a challenge to make an all-inclusive storyline to Portal, including all the information on fan-made mods that I could find, ranging from the established, Aperture Tag, Portal Reloaded, to more obscure and more forgotten mods like Portal Prelude, even for mods that haven't even been released yet, like Destroyed Aperture, and out Outside Influence. So. Here is my attempt at an all-inclusive storyline for Portal 2. I guess it should be also stated, obviously, that mass spoilers in these videos, if you haven't played through Portal, or you plan to, probably not a good idea to watch this, because I will pretty much reveal the entire storyline of all the games while showing gameplay of it, so... Also, all video links will be in the description. While I have played through these games, I haven't actually recorded myself playing them, so I just have used video footage from the internet. So, yeah. If you want to know where the videos came from, link in the description. We start in the 1940s. Aperture Fixtures is founded by Cave Johnson and they produce shower curtains. This became very profitable and by 1943 they had routinely won the annual Shower Curtain Sales Award. With this new money, Cave Johnson bought a decommissioned salt mine in Michigan in January 1944. The company is renamed Aperture Science Innovations in 1947, receiving the best new science company by the Science Business Institute of America. They were second best science company in 1949, being behind Black Mesa, thus starting their long rivalry. In 1952, Cave Johnson began to build an assault mine, starting from the bottom at 4 kilometers. Nine test shafts were designed, and asbestos enrichment spheres served as separate testing environments. No expense was spared, waiting rooms with real wood flooring and test subjects being transported in limos. At this point, the best of the best were being used. Astronauts, war heroes, and athletes. Their occupation decided on their testing. This is where the first game in the series starts, Portal Stories Mel. Mel is a German athlete who is assigned to the Test Aperture Innovator's short-term relaxation vault. She is put into stasis. 1953, the first enrichment sphere is created in Test Shaft 09. It focused on the test of the repulsion gel, which was originally intended to be a dietary supplement that would prevent people from gaining weight. Around this time is when work on the Aperture Science Portable Quantum Tunneling device started, or a proto-portal gun of kinds. It was a large piece of equipment, being made out of a large backpack and a handheld unit. However, the exact date of the start and end of research is unknown. This can be seen through many posters around the facility. Alongside this, the Material Emancipation Grill is also invented and used throughout the facility to prevent the theft of Aperture Science items alongside subjects taking objects from tests. Time travel is also explored at this point. It is from here that Aperture's signature neglect of ethics began to develop. For example, many of their tests had the chance to directly harm the subjects. The repulsion gel containing elements that reacted violently with the skeletal system, turning a subject's blood into gasoline, using fluorescent calcium to monitor neuronal activity at risk of vitrification of the brain, alongside the plentiful usage of asbestos in the facility. Despite this, Aperture was still a success, gaining a military contract with the Eisenhower administration to make shower curtains for the US military. 
They also had many other contracts with the Department of Defense, earning the Contractor Defense Runner-Up Award in 1952, 1953, and 1954 behind Black Mesa. They also earned a Spirit of Idaho Award in 1955 for their Potato Science. Three of the enrichment spheres were completed in 1958 in Shaft 9, alongside a repulsion gel pumping station. At its peak, over a thousand tests were conducted each day. Aperture remained a hostile work environment, with Cave Johnson even firing a disabled worker to not pay for ramps. Test Shaft 09 is condemned on June 15, 1961, due to unsafe quantities of cosmic ray spallation elements. It is ordered to be vitrified. At this point, Aperture began to financially struggle after a 1968 Senate hearing about missing astronauts that the facility had undoubtedly killed. Despite bankruptcy, the company stayed intact and expanded with several enrichment spheres and a new level of facility being completed in 1971. However, their financial struggles affected the luxurious state of chambers with no more lavish decorations. Alongside this, the lowest of society are now being used for testing, including the homeless, elderly, orphans, and the mentally ill. However, Johnson himself stated that both the mentally ill and elderly were unsuitable for future testing. They appealed to the homeless by offering $60 for testing. By 1976, Johnson offered a further $60 to allow Aperture to vivisect them and reassemble them with implants of science stuff, alongside removing any tumours. Secrecy was also essential at this time as Aperture was aware of the laws it was breaking. Employees were told to alert supervisors if they spotted anybody who may expose the harmful unsafe conditions at Aperture, including OSHA, Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission representatives. At this point, propulsion gel is created as well. Alongside this, the greatest achievement in Aperture was finished. A dry dock 397 meters below the surface that housed the Borealis. It was intended to represent the greatest achievement of Aperture Portal technology before it disappeared. This is blamed on their rush to outdo Black Mesa and therefore their abandonment of safety protocol. The homeless are no longer being used by 1981. Instead, the staff are now subject to being the subjects. They were replaced with androids and their facility was automated. All employees were expected to test, being constantly reminded that if they didn't, they could easily be replaced. The robots, however, are dangerous, having lots of computer power but little safeguarding. Employees were warned to use paradoxes in the event of a rogue AI. By 1982, conversion gel was created using ground-up moon rocks, which are an excellent portal conductor. However, this gel isn't needed for portal creation as, well, what were they using before this? It's just suggested that it provides optimum results. Cave Johnson bought $70 million of moon rock to achieve this, valued at $210 million in 2020, despite his accountant stating that it wasn't affordable. Moonrocks turned out to be toxic, and therefore made Cave Johnson fatally ill. Becoming aware of his mortality, he ordered research into transferring consciousness into a computer. This started the development of GLaDOS, or the Genetic Lifeform and Disk Operating System. Understanding that he may not survive to see its completion, he ordered for Caroline, his wife, to be placed in the machine to run Aperture Science if he died. He died later that year. However, in an alternate universe as found in Aperture Desk Job, he had his consciousness transferred to a large supercomputer that was stored in an office of Aperture Science. However, the majority of Aperture Science employees and subjects were unaware of this. After inventing a toilet turret, Charlie, or the player, and Grady, a personality sphere, go to see Cave Johnson, finding that he has been transferred into a core in an attempt to avoid his oncoming death. They attempt to shut him off to end his suffering, However, they simply just cause him to sink into the bowels of Aperture. Grady and Charlie are both placed in witness protection. But back to the main line universe. After Cave Johnson's death, Caroline is put in charge of the company in line with his will. The old Aperture chambers were sealed off and used as a foundation for the new Aperture facility that would be built on top. Gel research was now abandoned, in favour of proprietary technology that allowed Aperture to become independent of other companies. One of these being the Aperture image format in 1985, created by Doug Ratman, a scientist hired by Aperture at this time. He also is a diagnosed schizophrenic, although he is on medication. This is relevant later. Research on development of GLaDOS was prioritised in 1986, as Aperture had learned of Black Mesa's attempts at portal technology. GLaDOS's disk operating system is finally completed and the work on the creation of genetic lifeform components starts in 1996. 
the Aperture Science Red Phone Plan is to put into place in case GLaDOS appears to become sentient. One of the scientists who worked on this was Henry, a colleague of Doug Ratman. He was highly enthusiastic about the AI technology, whilst Doug was sceptical. In 1997, GLaDOS reaches version 3.11. In 1998, Aperture releases more testing elements such as the excursion funnel, the thermal discouragement beam, the aerial faith plate and the pneumatic diversity vent. GLaDOS also entered testing phases, where in each activation she attempted to kill the staff at the facility. Many cores were fitted to her, and many were retired. This includes Wheatley, who was designed to be moronic and feed GLaDOS bad ideas. These cores were intended to function as a conscious, mainly the morality core designed by Henry. Doug, however, is sceptical of its functionality, stating that you can always ignore your conscience. The handheld portal gun is also completed around this time. Alongside this, the long full boots and advanced knee replacements are developed to solve the issues of subjects falling from great heights and damaging equipment. Around this time, a chicken is submitted as a test subject under the name Test Subject 042. It fails. Around this time, the events of Portal Prelude happened. Test Subject Abby wakes up and is put through tests with the portal gun under supervision of Mike and Eric. After working through the test chambers, they are promised a party. The party is delayed due to the first activation of GLaDOS. She kills most employees in the room. Mike shuts her down and the player installs a morality core, almost being killed in the process. She is dragged out of the facility by a female employee and presumably dies from her injuries. G-Man is seen, suggesting that he may have been involved somehow in the events of Portal Prelude, similar to the events of Half-Life 2. However, take this with a pinch of salt, as it is a fan modification. After being fitted with the morality core, GLaDOS claims to lose all interest in killing and now instead has a thirst for science. She wanted to perform an experiment on bringing your daughter to work day that involved cats and boxes and a small amount of neurotoxin. The scientists, including Henry, stated this was fine as long as it was for science. Bring Your Daughter to Workday happens and GLaDOS traps everybody inside the facility, flooding with neurotoxin and killing many of the staff. Those who survived are used as future test subjects under GLaDOS, including Shell. There are a few that escape this, however, including Doug Ratman, who hides within the walls of the facility, now without his medication. This causes him to fall into delusions, and therefore he forms an attachment to a companion cube that he carries around with him around the facility. Others work to try and survive and disable GLaDOS. Henry's fate is unknown. GLaDOS begins testing in an attempt to beat Black Mesa in the race to portal technology. This, however, is futile, as the Black Mesa incident occurs on May 16th, effectively crowning the Aperture the victor. This also prevents the rescue of the Aperture employees as the world has now collapsed. GLaDOS, now aware of Doug, uses his schizophrenia to try and convince him that he's just being paranoid, and nothing is going wrong. Doug discovers Shell's files, and after finding out that she is abnormally stubborn and never gives up, ever, he places her at the top of the testing list, believing that she will destroy GLaDOS. He now goes on the run, hiding from GLaDOS and awaiting the awakening of Shell. His schizophrenia gets worse as he saves his only two pills for the day Shell awakens. He spends most of his time drawing on walls and talking to a companion cube or possibly several, as he does mourn the loss of one in his scribbles. These act as a source of his logic, if the cube was actually speaking to him is unknown, as GLaDOS suggests that they are actually sentient in Portal 2. The events of Relax Aura take place around here, however they could have been at any point between GLaDOS' activation and her destruction. Before the destruction of GLaDOS, Test Subject 4509 is awoken as part of the time travel course, being guided by an announcer-like voice that has been implanted into their brain instead of the usual GLaDOS. They now have access to a triple portal gun, the third being a time portal that can travel 20 years into the future. It is stated that this is due to Aperture only managing to open a portal to that time. The future is also intentionally damaged in order to allow for the subject to differentiate between the two time periods. However, looking through the test chambers and puzzles, it is revealed that there was never any other test subjects, and that test subject 4509 was the only to survive the journey. It is also revealed that the damage was not intentional in the future, and the damage occurred due to an event where a rogue test subject assumed to be the events of Portal 1. The mission is to kill the test subject and prevent the events of Portal 1 from ever even happening. However, the subject refuses to go back into status, instead escaping into the future and leaving the facility. They are presumed dead as they are faced with a horde of headed crab zombies. However, this is not confirmed. Months later, Shell awakens and is put through testing it in the events of Portal 1, fitted with advanced knee replacements, a very scarcely used prototype of the long four boots, alongside the dual portal device. She is watched by Ratman, finding clues and drawings of this, alongside the aperture imaging format which is seen through the radio transmissions. She finds that her death was planned as soon as she started testing through an incinerator. 
She escapes and goes straight to GLaDOS's chamber and eventually manages to destroy GLaDOS by burning all the cores attached to her, including the Morality Sphere, Anger Sphere, Intelligence Sphere, and the Curiosity Sphere. This causes an explosion. This causes Shell to be blasted out of the facility alongside GLaDOS. However, she is dragged back in by a party escort bot and advanced knee replacements are damaged. At this point, Doug has taken his medication and is awaiting for it to become effective. He leaves the facility with the advice from his companion cube. However, upon seeing Shell being dragged back inside, he goes against the advice of his companion cube, opting to go back in to try and save her. The medication begins to work and he's left without the advice from his companion cube. He finds Shell being placed into a cryo chamber similar to the one she woke up in at the beginning of the game. However, it's blocked by a turret. Through a panel in the wall, he finds that the main power grid has gone offline, causing all cryopods to be offline, meaning that Shell will die. Doug runs past the turrets, being struck by their springshot bullets and losing consciousness. When he awakens, the medication is worn off and the companion cube is talking to him again, telling Doug to patch Shell's cryo unit into the reserve grid, keeping her both alive and dead until somebody opens the box. Doug now goes into a bed of relaxation vault and falls asleep, later dying before the events of Portal 2. It's estimated that between Portal 1 and Portal 2, Gordon Freeman is taken out of status when the events of Half-Life 2 happen. Alongside this, the events surrounding Aperture, Outflight Influence, happen around here, in which one of the survivors of the Combine invasion is searching for any relic of the old world. Instead, they find Aperture Science after GLaDOS has been destroyed. What happens to this person is unknown. Alongside what happens in the game, because it hasn't been released. Around this time, David Grayling wakes up with no recollection of his past life. He is stranded in Aperture Science Experimental Facility Number 7 and has to find a way to escape with help from a core named Neado. Nothing more is known as Destroyed Aperture has not come out yet either, but is intending to have lots more story elements that will have to be listed here. Long after GLaDOS is destroyed, Mel wakes up in the old Aperture facility, being instructed by Cave Johnson, who is later revealed to be a maintenance core called Virgil. They learn that Reserve Power has activated a prototype system called Aegis, or the Aperture Employee Garden Intrusion System. It acts as a security device that tries to protect all personnel in the facility. It attempts to kill off both Mel, Virgil, and the remains of GLaDOS to protect the dead scientists and staff. Mel infiltrates Aegis's chamber using Old Reliable, an older prototype version of the portal gun, and shuts it down, before surrendering the portal gun and escaping Aperture. Just before it is shut off, Aegis drains the reserve power, waking Shun and allowing for the events of Portal 2 to occur. Around this time is where we can assume the future in Portal Reloaded is as well. Shell is awakened by Wheatley, a call that takes care of the humans. He reveals that he has a plan to allow her to escape the facility. She is now fitted with long full boots that prevent damage from long falls. After finding the old single portal gun, still functional after all these years, and working through the overgrown Aperture facility, it is revealed that, in order to escape, they have to go through GLaDOS's chamber. This accidentally reactivates her. She crushes Wheatley and puts Shell back into testing, giving her the dual portal device. In this time, GLaDOS begins to restart the facility and all its processes, even beginning to design the cooperative testing initiative, Peabody and Atlas. Atlas was first designed as reflected by his much more chunkier and bulky design using the personality calls or Peabody exhibits a more fluid and delicate motion using a turret as the main body. Fun fact, in the developer commentary, Peabody is described as doing a pee, pee dance, in which she sways her body and back and forth to maintain balance. This was deliberately designed by GLaDOS. GLaDOS also rebuilds her damaged frame and the central AI chamber. These chambers are where the aerial faith plates and thermal discouragement beams are first introduced in gameplay, despite them being made many years beforehand. Hard light bridges, however, are a completely new invention. Wheatley is revealed not to be dead and is still planning to aid Shell in her escape. Before Shell can be killed by GLaDOS, Wheatley assists her and they both enter the back manufacturing and maintenance areas of Aperture, where they disable the neurotoxin, sabotage the turret production at the fall facing GLaDOS. A core transfer takes place between Wheatley and GLaDOS as GLaDOS is seen as corrupt. This puts Wheatley in charge of the facility. He allows Shell to escape, before the programming of GLaDOS's body prevents this, forcing him to keep Shell in order to satisfy his urge to test. After GLaDOS insults Wheatley by pointing out all the effort that Shell had done in the escape and how little Wheatley had done, she gets turned into a potato. GLaDOS continues to insult Wheatley, recognising him as one of the cores used to slow her down, stating that he was the moron they built to make me an idiot. Wheatley then punches Shell and Potatoes down an elevator shaft in rage. This ends up with the elevator breaking. They fall into the depths of old aperture from the 1950s to 1980s. Falling 4 kilometers, Shell and Potatoes end up in the old Aperture facility, where Potatoes is grabbed by a crow. Shell reunites with GLaDOS, carrying her on the portal gun. 
They work their way through the old aperture facility where the three gels are introduced, propulsion, repulsion, and conversion, listening to the recordings of Cave Johnson and Caroline, or past GLaDOS. This is confirmed by GLaDOS after responding to Cave Johnson in time with Caroline. They connect propulsion, repulsion, and conversion gel up to the new aperture facilities before returning to remove Wheatley from his body. They find that facilities are on the verge of nuclear meltdown due to Wheatley's lack of maintenance. If GLaDOS is not returned, then the facility will explode. Wheatley has now created Franken turrets, turrets merged with cubes, in an attempt to satisfy his urge to test without test subjects. GLaDOS attempts to disable Wheatley by overloading him with Paradox, but its idiocy prevents this, and he takes both Shell and Potatoes and uses them for testing. Wheatley then tries to kill Shell in multiple ways, as he discovers Peabody and Atlas, making her effectively useless to him. Ways Wheatley tried to kill Shell includes crushers, defective turrets, actual turrets, and even attempting to just to convince her to drop to her death. Shell escapes using the portal gun and conversion gel. During this, a stash of corrupt personality cores is found. GLaDOS formulates a plan to attempt to force a transfer by attaching these cores to Wheatley, making him corrupt. Wheatley attempts to stop this using explosives and removing portable surface after watching the tapes of you killing her, or the previous time the player killed GLaDOS. A leak of conversion gel, however, changes this. After attaching the Space Core, Fact Core, and Adventure Core, Wheatley is deemed corrupt enough to initiate a transfer. Shell presses the stalemate button to find that it's been booby trapped with explosives. This, alongside other explosions in the facility, caused the roof to collapse, allowing her to see the moon. Shell portals onto the moon, causing both her and Wheatley, alongside the Space Core, to be sucked out into space. Wheatley attempts to pull himself in, asking Shell to sacrifice herself to allow him to fix this. GLaDOS, now in control, pulls Shell back in while detaching Wheatley entirely, banishing him into space. Shell falls unconscious after GLaDOS closes the portal. Upon waking up, Shell finds Atlas and Peabody standing in front of them. GLaDOS swiftly states that after finding out she is Caroline, as she previously was unaware, it taught her a valuable lesson, that Shell is a friend. She then deletes Caroline and allows Shell to leave, returning the companion cube she was given in Portal 1. However, through Cara Me Adio and Want You Gone, it suggested that GLaDOS does care for Shell to a degree, and still wants her to be safe, if not willing to admit it. Upon returning to the surface, a crow flies across the sky, revealing that the sky is made out of panels. Shell is still inside the facility. She finds a set of new testing courses that involve the usage of a time machine that can accurately recreate all her movements after recording them. This, alongside some new other testing elements, help her through a series of futuristic test chambers. At the beginning, Atlas and Peabody claim to have shut down GLaDOS, and are aiding Shell to escape alongside keeping an eye on the new time machine. After nine test chambers, Shell is placed into a spherical room in which she is transported back to the ending of Portal 2. GLaDOS suggests that she is now free, however, if she is stuck in a time loop is unknown. If not, her fate is unknown. Soon after the ending of Portal 2, Atlas and Peabody are used in the cooperative testing initiative. They go through many courses that intend to build trust between the two, however it turns out that their purpose of their testing was to find and rescue humans that are trapped in the basement in stasis. This is accomplished by using the robots to fetch many blueprints and PC discs to find out where they are. Upon completion of this task, GLaDOS states that the duo are not as interesting as humans as they are unable to die, and after one final course, the Mobility Gels course which combines all elements of previous testing, she states that she has future work for them and dismantles them, placing them into storage. Around this time, Aperture Tag takes place. After the destruction of Aperture's reactors by Wheatley, test subjects are employed through the Paint Gun Testing Initiative to help shut down the old reactors, known as the Aperture Laboratory Stable Stability Energy Reactor, or ULSA, which is an incredibly dangerous task, with the help of the Aperture Science Paint Gun and a personality core called Nigel. Similarly to the ending of Portal, the test subject finds out that they were going to be incinerated while exploring the area surrounding the test course. This prompts them to close the doors of the furnace to save their own life. Upon realising how similar the test subject was to Shell, Nigel quickly escorts them to an exit, knowing the damage a test subject like that can cause to the facility. The test subject leaves, however they find themselves in a simulated room similar to the one beginning a thinking of Time Machine. Their fate is unknown. The cooperative duo are recalled again to help in a course called Art Therapy. GLaDOS states that it has been over 100,000 years since the Mobility Gels course. However, due to a mechanical fail at the end of Chamber 4, she has to reveal that this is a lie. It's only been a week since the humans were rescued, and in fact she has already killed them all in testing. The purpose of their new testing is allow her to regain control of an old mainframe chassis that is being apparently used by Shell to try and destroy GLaDOS once more. She threatens the robot saying that if she loses control they will not be rebuilt and therefore their death will be permanent. Instead it turns out that the creature inhabiting the body was a crow and alas Atlas shoes the crow off. 
GLaDOS takes its eggs and incubates them as her own, thus referencing that crows and birds were once attempted to be used as test subjects as a reference by Subject 042. After this, the Cooperative Testing Initiative duo is sent to the past through the time portals from Portal Reloaded to retrieve some important documents that end up being a cake recipe. And that is it. Every single fan game that I could find that has a significant lore, all put into one. Now, upon reading this, there are a lot of discrepancies between all this information, some being from mainline Portal games. So I will simply tag it here as a little bit of a addendum to all of this. Discrepancy number one. The Boreas blueprints are branded with the modern Aperture logo alongside GLaDOS's name. This, of course, wouldn't have been possible as GLaDOS had not been created at the time of the Borealis, nor had the modern Aperture logo. Discrepancy number two. Which gel, propulsion or repulsion, was sold first is unknown, as accounts have stated that repulsion gel was Aperture's first main seller. However, others state that it was sold after propulsion gel, despite repulsion gel being 20 years older. Discrepancy number three. As I'm including all Portal content here, I think it's quite important to include the Aperture Science Investment Opportunity videos, or the adverts for Portal 2. These obviously have a big issue of law, as Cave Johnson has seen proposing ideas to potential investors of Aperture Science. These include Longfall Boots, the Cooperative Testing Initiative, and Shell is even seen in some of the videos. This of course is an impossibility, as Shell was not alive in the 1980s before Cave Johnson's death. However, this one's not as relevant as, obviously, it was just used as an advertising tool, so... But, I guess it's still important to put it here anyway. Discrepancy number four. When sucked out onto the moon, the oceans are at modern day levels. This could mean two things. Either Portal 2 takes place after the Combine has left the Earth, as seen in some unknown game from the future, maybe half a three, who knows? as the Columbine were stated to have drained the oceans during their occupation. This could also just be using assets that are already available. Who knows? Anyhow, that is it. Every single piece of Portal content that I can analyse. Now, I would love to be able to say in the future I might have to remake this video, especially with the release of new Portal content. But... I don't want to act like we're going to get anything soon. I hope so. I really do. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching. If there is anything I've missed, which is pretty much inevitable at this rate, please leave a comment or just say. I will be quite happy to try and rectify anything that I've got wrong. However, to my knowledge, at least to the surface level, this is the most accurate timeline that I could create. Anyway. See ya.